Uh, please continue to eat your lunches. We're going to start. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, once again, just as a reminder, I think everything, the, the texting of the questions is going really well, so I'm really excited about that. We're having a good time. And additionally, if anyone's using social media, which almost everyone is, they can hashtag techtainment. Uh, this, this panel, this, this keynote, actually was really how I envisioned what was going to happen uh, uh, when, when we, we envisioned doing this. Um, I am uh, friendly with um, Kim Gamada from Katz Golden Rosamond's uh, the partner, uh, Chef Rosamond, and I said, you know, what I really want is to have fantastic uh, comic book writers and, and have them speak about being creators, and this is how this happened. But uh, I had the pleasure of being introduced to, to Caitlin, sorry, uh, by being introduced to Chet Rosamond. Uh, I, had, I had broached the idea of having comic book creators speak to our panel last year, and I'm so happy that the innovative idea has come to fruition. This is, this is really exciting for me. Uh, Caitlin, who has, has begun a career as an entertainment business lawyer over 10 years ago, and she worked with various artists so that when she joined the firm, they joined with her. Um, she represents intra, uh, interested artists and writers and personalities and creators and deals of all types. She has worked with clients on matters including the acquisition of licensing <laughs> media properties, option development, publishing agreements, and television, literary comic books, graphic novels, and motion fiction industries. Um, I was ecstatic though when she told me that Ed Brubaker would be the comic book writer that would be presenting to Techtainment. Ed is personally one of my favorite comic book writers, and I can promise you I'm not just telling you that. Uh, I want to give you Exhibit A. This is actually, this is actually a portion of the, of the comic books that, that I have. Um, and, and if you know from comic books, I don't actually buy, since I have kids, I don't buy uh, single issues anymore. I used to. And you would basically, to know a real comic book uh, enthusiast, you basically buy the single issues, then you buy the paperback, and then you buy the hard copies. <laughs> so so these, are, these are four. I have four here. I have more at home. Um, these are some of his. And you all may know of uh, you know, Captain America. This is the impetus for uh, the Avengers movies that came out. So a um, little bio. I, t I talked to Ed a little before. He actually was very meticulous that there were um, production errors in the original, and he corrected them. This is, this is pretty amazing. Um, but he's one of the really few writers that you can reread someone's book over and over again and gain additional insight. Uh, after co conquering traditional comic book territory, Ed's best stories are based on the crime noir and spy genre and many others. But they are essentially puzzle pieces. Along with his artistic partner, Sean Phillips, who you'll see in, in some of these, He's able to create a three-dimensional adult world where characters are real and do very bad things, and they are not fairy tales. I don't really want to take up too much time to, to give them, so let me introduce Kim and Ed, and enjoy it, and um, I have to do one thing here, I think. Awesome. I have to do something here. She's going to do it. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. <laughs> Is mine on? Oh, yeah. I, don't know. I don't know if mine's on either. Hi. Um, so, as Mark uh, so uh, generously said, um, our firm, Katz, Golden, Rosamond, we represent lots of uh, creators in the entertainment field, but we pride ourselves in how many um, comic book creators we, we represent. Uh, one of my favorites, I thought was most appropriate for today, was, is Ed, because Ed has worked in literally every capacity you could as a comic book creator and then has also successfully moved into TV and film, adapting not only his work like, you know, the works you're seeing up here uh, in progress, but also original work. Um, and we can, of course, if you guys are interested, we can talk about the legal part of that, but the most interesting part of all of this is the creative. Um, Ed, I wanted to start with um, when you were an architect at Marvel and <laughs> what, what that meant. So Marvel had this program, I don't know what it was like, how many years ago was this? Like six years ago? Seven, yeah. No, it must have been longer than that. Where it was I like, left them like five years ago. Right, it was but, like maybe six, seven, eight years ago yeah. they had this program of like five, a handful of writers to sort of be in control of the entire universe. They called them the Marvel architects and you were in the presence of one. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that experience? <laughs> 
Well, we found out about it because we were at a, a we Marvel has these summits like three or four times a year where they fly in a lot of their top writers and they plan out the next year of Marvel and then they meet again in three months and sort of rejigger it and um, we were there one day and they just picked a bunch of us out of the room like oh you guys have to go do a photo shoot and then they told us this is what we were doing I was like oh this is none of us were prepared for this so the the architect's photo shoot is the worst photo oh it's hilarious no it's not it's so good it's so yeah funny. i insisted when they ran it in in the comic with my close-up that i could send in a different photo to photoshop over my face <laughs> <laughs> well and you became uh, one of the top writers there because you wrote i wrote captain america um i started on captain america in 2004 and was able to get permission to bring back his old dead sidekick, Bucky, and turn him into the Winter Soldier. And so all of those comics have gone on to influence all those Captain America movies, right. which is cool Right. Cool-ish. <laughs> cool butt. Yeah, cool butt. Cool butt. Um, one of the challenges, you know, of working with... Um, when you work for do any work for DC or with Marvel, you know they are these huge universes of licensed properties, and so the the creators that that do the work, whether it's writing or art or whatever, are all work for hire. Um, and I think, you know, until what 2004, 2005, very recently, yeah, people didn't really read their contracts. No, yeah, most of the or, comics industry, yeah. up until Caitlin, there were really only like two lawyers who, yeah. who really sought out comic book creators to sort of give them advice, and they pretty much had about 20% of the mm -hmm. industry was, had these two lawyers, and then a couple people, Robert Kirkman, who created The Walking Dead, right. and Brian Bendis, like, found Shep somehow. Mm -hmm who was like a legit Hollywood lawyer that didn't just specialize in comics right. people. Um, but then it's, now it's to the point where I feel like a lot of people yeah. in comics actually have lawyers representing them on their contracts. And when I started in the industry, it was like, if you wanted your lawyer to look at something, like DC Comics would get mad at you. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably. Like, Why do you want a lawyer to look at this? This is the standard deal. This is what everyone takes. Right. So We've all that heard was, that, haven't yeah. we? It was. You get these boilerplate things, and it's like, just sign this or you don't get the job. And there's like a line of people around the block who would happily sign this and take your job. So. Right. Well, and so as a lawyer, you know, when you walk into an industry, that's, that's how it works. Um, your challenge is, one, explaining to people, people don't really care what their rights are if it doesn't get them anywhere. Um, but, you know... Telling, explaining to people, here are your rights, here's what you can ask for, here's what's ridiculous, here's not. Um, being sensitive also, on the other hand, to the industry and the industry norms, um, which was a challenge, uh, <laughs> meaning you have to read it. Uh, and I think, you know, explaining to your client that um, when you do work for Marvel or do work for DC or any work for hire, you know, job. That means that they can make billions of dollars on the Winter Soldier, and that's not yours. And that's a really hard thing um, to explain. But why don't you, one of the things about Ed also is that he had an extraordinarily healthy, um, I think, but a healthy creator owned career before Marvel, during Marvel, and now since you've left Marvel, yeah, it's even better. Yeah. And so how did your experience, why don't you talk about how your experience at Marvel and doing that kind of work informed your creator-owned career? Well, kind of, it's like, like Caitlin said, when you're doing work for hire, you don't own any of it. And you know going in, you don't, and you, and you, take, it, you take it for what it is, because you're getting an opportunity to build an audience for your own work, hopefully, or you're just getting a chance to write that Avengers story you always wanted to write, or Superman, or whatever. Um, I always wanted to just write my own stuff, and, and I loved comics as a kid growing up, so I always had ideas for these stories and it seemed like the reason that I ended up at Marvel was because Marvel had started a company where they were they were publishing people who were on contracts there could do a book through their their company Icon where they retained all ownership and that DC Comics where I had worked before that doing Gotham Central and Catwoman and Batman and a bunch of other comics 
their company that they had Vertigo that you could do creator owned comics through, really the company owned everything and controlled everything and you just got a stake in, you know, in some situations. One of the deals I have there, Caitlin actually had to threaten to sue them to get them to pay us for our portion of the, the uh, option money when Warner Brothers optioned it to themselves for a, a pittance. I mean, you know, all in a day's work. Yeah. <laughs> so Marvel had this thing that, that I really wanted, which was to be able to do a comic, you know, through a large publisher where me and, the, and my collaborators would actually own it and control it. And so, you know, when I, when I was at the height of my sort of whatever comic book fame you can get, I, you know, was doing this Captain America story where he died and it got on front pages of papers all around the world, actually. And, you know, I was able to turn around from that and launch, you know, an independent crime comic, basically, and get Marvel to publish that and help really build a career for myself as someone who wasn't just going to be known for superhero comics. And that was Criminal? Yeah, it was Criminal, uh, which I still work on and now it's published through Image Comics. But because I had a deal where I could actually, because we owned it, that, you know, we actually got to move it from one publisher to another which I wouldn't have been able to do at DC Comics. Yeah, and I would say too that there was a big uh, shift, I would say around 2008 yeah. with Image, where Image Comics now is you know, the, the place to, to publish creator-owned comics. It's the, the deal, frankly, it's the best deal for creators where they own everything, they own all the rights, and Image simply licenses the the one right to publish the comics in yeah. digital and print, and so the creators themselves retain everything. And um, you know, our uh, our client Robert Kirkman, he published Walking Dead through Image, um, and we all I think you guys have probably heard of that show. Now he's um, like a part owner of the company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He actually runs the company so, now. So in like 2008, there was a, a, a for, you know, honestly, I, I, I don't know why these things happen. I was just really in the right place at the right time because that's when I started doing this work. Would people, Image really had a resurgence of, of um, actively seeking out young creators, not just people who had published before, that sort of Ouroboros of getting into an industry, no one will hire you unless you've done something, but how can you, you know, do something if no one will hire you? Um, Image was actively taking, you know, proudly taking risks on young creators, and I think partially because of the success of Walking Dead, but, yeah, they you know, money. The, the ability <laughs> to do that then sort of raised um, to now, they're the place to be, and so yeah. we moved your business over there. Yeah, yeah, um, and that was... Partly because I was done doing, I, I had burned out on doing superhero comics after about eight or ten years of doing them all the time. And uh, I had built up enough of an audience with, with the stuff that, my, my independent stuff, that I felt like I could just make a living doing that and spend whatever time I was, you know, giving to Marvel or DC, pursuing Hollywood jobs that I'd been turning down for years because I just didn't have time for anything. Right. Can you talk about, um, I'm just going to keep going on my list of questions, and so everyone just <laughs> holler if you have, but um, can you talk about the challenges, you know, as, like, using, uh, using Marvel and then your creator-owned work as an example, like, what are the different challenges and issues that come up um, in be working in both of those spaces, the licensed universe space and then your... Well, you but when you start doing work for hire or licensed stuff, you come in with this incredible enthusiasm for it, and then I think you keep the enthusiasm the less successful you are. Like I know a few, few people who work in that field who are really enthusiastic about it when, once they're successful because they, they're making a really good living, but then they see how much more the company is making off of their work than they are. And um, so I feel like that's one of those things you kind of juggle. And then you also, you have no control over you know, who's going to draw your project or what the advertising campaign is going to be or what mm -hmm. paper they're going to publish on. And I'm like a huge print snob in this, <laughs> in this digital age. I still love print. And um, so being able to choose what paper, like I remember one of those books he held up, I was, when I was publishing it through Marvel, I sent a bunch of the people at Marvel that book for their Christmas present because it came out at the end of November. 
And I was at the office a month later, and a bunch of people were like, wow, I wish our books could look this good. And I was like, well, you, this is one of your books. You, published, <laughs> you paid for the printing. He's like, yeah, but that costs 25 cents more a unit than we would spend. So like, I got to see firsthand what it's like when a company that was sort of an independently owned publishing house is bought by a Disney and how things change, which oh, right. was pretty much overnight things changed at that company. And, right. and as much as to try to keep Disney from messing with them, I think, as anything, because they thought, well, if we just show them we know what we're doing and that each quarter makes more money than the previous quarter, then they'll stay out of our way. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, what the Pixar guys had maybe told them. <laughs> um, so it became a nightmare immediately to work there because suddenly they wanted everyone to double their workload and they weren't offering anybody any raises for that. Editors were being sacked and their jobs weren't being replaced. Their, their jobs were being, you know, distributed among other employees. It was the classic, you know... Do more with less. Yeah, do more with less so that it looks like we're making more money than we really are. And when you're a freelancer in that environment, you feel immediately paranoid that yeah. everything's about to fall apart. And, you know, comics has a strange amount of... Uh, inability to actually fall apart. It always just feels like it's about to right. fall apart, but somehow it's it's still we it still keeps on. chugging. I don't I think it's just it's a it's a habit for a lot of people. Um, well, you you said earlier how one of the frustrations was not being able to choose your own artist and then yeah. in your creator owned work your work with Sean Phillips, the yeah. amazing artist there. I mean, Sean, you often say, and I love it, that Sean is your longest relationship side of your wife. Yeah, I started working with Sean the same month that I started dating Mel, and <laughs> and it's that was Sean and I started working together in two in uh, 1999 actually, and we still do a comic every month together. So I think we're now the longest consistent team in comics history. And what um, what is it like? What? How does the has the process evolved for you and Sean? Because you know each other so well. What does that change? How does that change the way you write your scripts? Or um, I think when I work for Sean, I I put in a lot less in general, like when of detail in the, into the descriptive parts. Like I know what he can do and not do, and so the moments where I'll write a lot of description, like in a, like you would in maybe a screenplay mm -hmm. for an establishing shot or something, is. It, those are the, the odd panel, like every four pages, where I feel like I have to explain something or find photos to link to, to give them an example. But for the most part, I just feel like our relationship, it's almost become like we're one person to where he, he gets exactly what I want to do and, and, you know, he pretty much always nails it. Or, and if he doesn't, you know, I can bug him to try to change it mm -hmm. and about... 10% of the time he will. <laughs> <laughs> and what are the challenges do you think in the in the creator own space doing your own work? The challenges there uh, well sometimes you're not working with an editor uh, I get lucky because Sean is almost like an editor because he's such a fast artist that he always wants more pages and uh, Robert Kirkman and I talk about that a lot that he thinks there'd be a lot less issues of The Walking Dead out there if Charlie Adlard wasn't drawing it because he demands pages like every three weeks for the next issue so and he's really fast and really fast. a lot of artists are slow so if the writer slows down the artist just stops turning in pages and then the writer's like oh they don't need pages yeah. so you have to be really self-motivated. It's, it's closer to being a novelist, probably, where you have to sit down and just force yourself to do all the work because there's no one cracking the whip on you or uh, no editors calling up everyone to make sure where everything is constantly. Right. So you have to really learn to run your own business, kind of. And you know, it's one of the things you and I dealt with early on right. when you first became my lawyer was like making sure I had contracts for all the people who work on my books and you know and that yeah. everything is done through my company yeah and, and that's another thing too that you know um another shift a cultural paradigm that had to shift in this industry you know where so many before we started working together which i think is sort of i we were right at the vanguard of this shift this movement uh towards actually documenting properly um <laughs> Uh, it, it, one of the challenges is it, really the whole industry, okay, so you sign your publishing deal, but as between creators, the whole industry was a handshake. 
yeah. which sends chills down my spine. And and famously, we were fine with that. Right, yeah, <laughs> they were fine until. And the thing is, is it's fine when the book doesn't make any money, which is weird, because usually I, I find in the in other contexts, like usually when you need a contract is when everything goes to hell. Yeah. In comics, you need a contract when everything goes well. Yeah, because that's, that's when you realize how screwed you got. And how much money, yeah. yeah. And like that really, um, you know, that really changed things for people. And, and they want to say, well, I, I love, love him. He's my buddy. Like, I've known him forever. And I, and I say to people all the time, that's great. <laughs> then he'll sign. <laughs> you know, like, it doesn't matter. And, and again, the, the, it, the, the, the pressure then was on me as, their, as a lawyer, because um, it is like the Wild West doing comics work, is that there's an ethical pressure on me to, you know, um, I think, to maybe it's not ethical as an ethics, but like a moral pressure on me to make sure that the deals are fair and that everybody is not only knows that they can be represented, but you know that I, I often have my client with whoever they're working with. If there is even any doubt, I say you need to call so and so up, and you need to talk this through with them before I'm putting it on paper. You need to talk about it because really. You know, we I, you document the hell out of something, it's, nothing's going to happen, and that's the goal, right? We don't yeah. want things, bad things, to happen. We've had bad things happen in our industry that we don't want to, re to repeat. But yeah. that's what people don't understand: is that there's a ton of you have to have a contract with the artist, with the letterer, with the colorist, with the if you hire a freelance editor. I mean, and then yeah, you never used to need those things, but right. now that Hollywood wants to buy everything, there's, yeah. they always want chain of title to right. prove that the letterer doesn't secretly own the thing. And you're like, do you know how comics work? No, and they don't. But, and they also, don't. you're dealing with a lot of artists who the second a contract lands in front of them, just start sweating. Because or they, they, yeah, they they're worried turtles. that they're going to miss yeah. some line of it. And, none of, and like a lot yeah. of them don't have lawyers, or they don't want a lawyer. And that's or they an don't want to have to pay for a lawyer, because it's right. such a, for a lot of people, it's such a small money field. But yeah, the, 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 you end up signing a lot of really dumb contracts. But I remember yeah. when we were first talking and putting together like work for hire agreements, like I remember calling you up because there was like two lines in this one and a half page thing where I was like, I, I feel weird about these lines because I would feel uncomfortable signing a document that had these, even though they were totally innocuous. It was just like, it sounded like lawyery. Yeah. So, and I know like artists are paranoid as hell about like anything that's just not plain and right and easy to, so we ended up like changing it yeah. to the point where like the people that she sent that contract to ended up hiring Caitlin to be their lawyer. Cause I was like, I just want to make With sure any contract, yeah, <laughs> but any, any person that I give a contract to, I want to make sure it's a contract I would feel comfortable signing myself. Right. So I feel like, and that's a really terrible way to be a businessman, no. honestly, no. but I think it's the right way. It is the right. And, and honestly, it's the way the comp business works, which is why I love working in it, frankly, because I feel like there is a, there is a. Because it's so small, everybody knows each other, everyone works with each other, everyone, um, God, you see each other at every convention. Yeah. You have to be able to look at people in the face and, and feel, I'd never give a contract to somebody that I wouldn't have a client of mine sign. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing, having a lawyer in the field like, can help you with in comics is these big, especially the big corporate publishers like Marvel and DC, a lot of them, they will not let you know like what standard industry rates are for things. So when you're getting hired for a job, they will try to figure out what is the least you'll possibly take. And having someone like Caitlin or Shep, they'll be like, oh no, they'll pay you three times that. And it's like, wait, what? So that was not a, you know, it wasn't until I, like I met like Frank Miller's lawyer when he was drunk at a bar once at a Comic-Con and, and basically like told me like how bad all the deals Marvel and DC offer people really are and I was like oh my god um, but yeah you find out you know oh you can get and you know someone who works within an industry knows what industry standards actually are and the publishers are happy to just be like no this is just what we pay all of our new people never believe that ever yeah <laughs> I'm looking at questions. So three came in, and I'm trying to decide which one I want to do first. Uh, while I do that, um, how 
So how would you say the industry, the comic book industry, before we get into comics to film and TV, because that's like the, the latest stage in your career and I think it's really exciting. Um, how would you say that the comics business has evolved? I mean, we've sort of been talking about that from a legal perspective, but creatively, and I think it's related to one of the questions, um, if you could start. Well, I think like. comics have become a lot. I mean, in my lifetime, when I was a kid, you had to hide the fact that you were into comics at all. And I feel like comics is now such a huge part of pop culture that it's just starting to get over its um, inferiority complex mm -hmm. in, in the world. You'll see people out reading comics, you know, on the subway in New York or, you know, at a coffee shop in L.A., um, and it's really become, you know, just just a big piece of pop culture. I mean, ev almost everything on the WB is based on a comic yeah. book, um, and so that that has really changed. And when you look at the stores, I feel like the the biggest change in the last ten years for me is seeing how like me and several, you know, of my peers are able to actually make a living through comic book store sales doing, you know, stuff that you couldn't sell at all like right. 10 years ago, but that's true. But that's changed. There's a big shift through bookstores for like the young adult market, which I feel like sort of inherited the manga market mm -hmm. a little bit, but you see these stores that you, these uh, books you can't even find in a comic book store that sell 100,000 copies to teenage girls or little girls through right. bookstores. Which is the So rarest. it's a much more diverse industry than it's ever been before. How do you, the question from um, our colleagues here, do you think that technology has changed the way readers will consume comics? Do you believe that changes for the better or for the worse? I think technology has changed the way we consume almost everything. Um, and in my opinion, probably for the worst to some degree. Um, I don't think reading a digital comic, if you are someone who grew up reading paper, is as satisfying. And there are like studies from MIT and stuff that show that you that you absorb like 20 to 25 percent of your reading when you're reading digitally as opposed to on paper. But mm -hmm. but just from a statistic, just from like a just an artistic standpoint, like paper will always be king to me. But but I'm not opposed to people reading digital stuff. I make a lot of money on digital yeah. comics. I would say, yeah. I, <laughs> I would just say feel too. like it's ma it's made us more hyperactive. You can't lose. Yeah. I don't. I don't feel like I lose myself in a story when I'm reading it on a device that I can check my email on. Right. Right. You know, or get or my texts appear on it or whatever. I would say too that about five years ago, when um, digital rights management is a big question with with digital comics. Oh yeah. How do foreign you, publishers are all yeah. about that now too. I mean, yeah. how you protect protect your, you know, from, 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 you know, from, from piracy, that's a huge problem. And I think right when we were starting to really talk about digital comics and digital delivery, that was an issue we had to work through as an industry together. Yeah. And everyone was panicking about the death of print and, yeah. and what would happen. And the it could print be sales are better now. Bit much better. Yeah. <laughs> I also think too, um, from a foreign perspective, when I do foreign licensing, of our clients' books, um, you know, before I would say five years ago, um, you know, this is presented just purely data from a data perspective. Um, most you would never get a license offer um, or a, a publishing offer from Russia or Brazil, yeah, because that those markets are just they're they pirate. That's yeah. that's what's available. Never from India, never from China. Yeah. You get mostly from continental Europe. Um, but otherwise, like you just wouldn't, there wasn't really a big robust market. We're getting offers that are real from yeah. Russia, Brazil, Mexico, all over. I think I just did a deal in Turkey. I mean, like, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying that with such shock because what it means is that there are translations of, of everyone's yeah. works being offered. And it, to me, it's such a normalization of comics and the comics are going so much further and people don't, in the other countries, don't have to read them in English. Yeah. They get to read them in their own language. They get to be localized to a certain extent. Yeah, the purists will, cool. that's where the piracy, I mean, piracy sort of forced digital comics on people. Kind of, because There were people who worked at comic stores that were just scanning every page of every comic the night before it came out and putting it on the internet for free. And then, and, in, yeah, you know, 10,000, yeah. 20,000, 100,000 people the next day would have read the thing for free instead of paying for it. So as a content creator, we 
yeah, I'm we, really opposed we were, to that. Right, that <laughs> sucks. And, but Di- Image, when they started doing di- offering digital comics for sale, they were digital, right? They are DRM free. Yeah, yeah, and we don't make it a, a hoop to jump through that you have to log into the internet to read your thing. I think that's bullshit. I think the, if anything, the digital, the technology has probably broadened the scope of what, what can be considered successful in comics and it's made the bigger, I mean, what you'll find when you look at digital comics is that the least successful stuff is probably the superhero stuff, except for something like Marvel's website where you can be a subscriber and go in and read everything that they've published for free but they don't actually pay any of the creators a royalty on any of that. And they, you know, so that really sucks. So we've got, okay, I'm getting from the audience that we need to talk about um, all of the stuff you're adapting because there's some really oh, okay. good questions okay. about, okay, so first question, it, it really bummed me here. Budget-wise, how developing, how's developing a story in comics compare with other media? Budget-wise, um, well, you never think about the budget on comics because you can draw you can draw Star Wars for the same price that you can draw a Jim Jarmusch movie. Um, <laughs> so when you move into, I was recently dealing with this with one of my projects when we were starting to develop it as a TV series. Was you immediately start thinking how much is this going to cost per episode and what is the likelihood of getting this on the air because of that, and it really gets in your head. We had an actress attached to one of our projects, and I was writing it, and it took place in London, and and I was like, well, is she even going to want to move to London, or am I just writing this thing for, am I going to have to move everything to Washington, D.C., or New York, you know, when I'm done? So you think about that a lot more when you're, but they tell you when you're writing a pilot never to worry about how much it's going to cost. They'll deal with that later. So, like, the development for film and TV is kind of like pie in the sky when you're actually doing the writing itself. Or they, but, but in the back of your head, you're always thinking, ah, this is going to be way too expensive. They're going to make me cut all this out. And I never have that problem when I'm writing comics. I think it frees my imagination a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And I would say from a business perspective, if this question was intended to be like, okay, well, what is, what's the cost of producing a comic? I would say on average, if you're doing a book at Image, and this can wildly vary depending on the page rate of an artist or the page rate of the colorist letter, yada, yada, yada. Um, it could be anywhere for an entire arc, so a trade, uh, which is like five or six issues, 50 grand. Yeah. So that's an entire, you know, that's five issues of story. That's yeah. not as compared to, I mean, a novel. You don't need any money, really. You need a computer. Um, but the, the more talent you have, you know, working on the book, um, the more expensive it's going to be. But that yeah. doesn't even remotely compare yeah, to what it's, it's still, like to produce an episode of television. Yeah, and it, I mean, the lack of roadblocks, too. Yeah. You just, I write something, an artist draws it, another artist colors yeah. it, and then it's published, like, a month later. Like, that, you know... Uh, this is why all my friends who are screenwriters keep wanting me to get them into comics, even though they make way more money doing screenwriting. <laughs> but it's just like see, you get to yeah. see your vision or as close to it as you can get pretty quickly. Okay, this is a good. Qu- this is an interesting question. I don't even actually know the answer to this one. Okay. Um, so this is some. Uh, let's see. Some comic book writers like creating creator-owned books and then having other writers write those books. Um, are you protective of this? Do you foresee in 30 years other writing, writers still writing criminal or any of your other works? No, I don't think I could ever... I don't think I could see that. I know Kirkman has started doing that, like creating things and then giving them to other people to write. Um, but I think he's more of an idea factory guy and mm-hmm. I write much more, you know, just sort of as a form of therapy for my fucked up childhood. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I would, don't think that's Kirkman's like, deal. I'm more, I'm more like Charles Schultz, where it's like, once I'm dead, just reprint it every day. <laughs> I will write that down. No yeah. worries. Um, let's see. So um, there is a question on here that um, uh, that I think is a it, it's not quite there, but it, it brings me to um, what about? Let's talk about bringing your, your creator-owned books to the screen, whether it's TV or film or features, and then, you know, how, what's that like? What's that process been like for you? Um, well, every time it's a little bit different, as you know. Um, 
you know, when I first started optioning things to Hollywood, you would get like a standard option fee and sometimes you'd get attached to write the screenplay for some nominal fee if you weren't in the Writers Guild yet. Um, and then it's, it's usually, if it's a movie, you get 10% of the purchase price up front and, you know, and, and if they make the movie, then you get the full purchase price. Um, what you learn pretty quickly is just how slow everything in Hollywood moves and how every single time you're signing one of those things, there's like a 90 to 95% chance nothing will ever come of it. Mm -hmm. So you're really gambling on them as much as they're sort of throwing a little bit of money at you. In, and you're, you really just have to kind of cross your fingers. Like I've come close a few times to getting a movie made based on one of my things. And they just, you know, there's so many moving parts compared to comics. There's so right. many directors and studio heads. We had a studio head at one at Fox who was really against one of my projects there. And so when it reverted to us, we took it and sold it to Sony. And then the Sony hack happened. <laughs> And so the head of Sony was ousted like three months later, and then the guy from Fox took over Sony, and I was just like, <laughs> fucking God, he's, he's following me around I'm like a magnet for this executive who hates my work. Um, but then it turned out to be okay because a hot director there likes yeah, it. So, so it turns out studio executives don't actually have personal taste. Yeah. <laughs> they just like whatever the hot director wants to do. Um, yeah. There's something to that. And, and we would look at, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, we look at uh, people talk about having your creator own book or whatever and making it into a movie or a film as if that's the end goal. And, I, and I'm going to blow your doors off when, you, when I say that we look at a movie, we look at the, you know, Walking Dead show as a 30 to hour long advertisement for the book yeah because that's where <laughs> you make your money it's not in television and film it's when people watch the movie watch the show and then buy your book yeah by the hundreds of thousands I mean that's really where that's why we're so my firm and my practice my firm my colleagues we are so very protective of um, comic book creators are very unique too because they are in a, in a very unique merchandising position um, because they are adept in that, already plugged into that, um, that portion of the population that buys everything. Yeah. They buy the video games, they buy the figurines, they buy the posters, they buy everything. And so they already have brand name recognition. Yeah, they come, we yeah. come preloaded with like Hall H, uh, yeah. Comic Con privileges. Right, <laughs> right, um, right. So but we, yeah, that's the difference between that. what you guys have been able to do and other. When I first started selling things, I, I would just use whatever lawyer my agents recommended. And, and on, on a recent deal, when I, I finally just brought Caitlin and Shep in on it, and, and they had all this precedent because of other clients and because of The Walking Dead and things like that to retain like video game rights and likeness rights for the comic book and all these things that all the studios just gobble that stuff up for nothing. They don't even, they just put it in yeah. the contract that they just get everything for this deal. But if you can show them like, well, no, you're, you know, we know we can sell these video game rights based on the comic or. And we usually you know. do a, like a license back where we, or we give them a portion of what we sell, like a small royalty. But the reality is, is that it's a huge amount of money to the individual creator. It's not even a blip on the screen of a network or studio. So frankly, it's not, a, it's not that much of a mental leap for them to give it over to let us reserve it and it's all it's about again it's about educating studios and networks about how comic book creators are different um than their average creator yeah and this is a thing novelists just don't know about i think right. too because like, well, i think most novelists yeah. would want to retain all this stuff they too. can retain publishing but like yeah. merchandising i mean they may some of them do oh, my, my clients do but like <laughs> jam it in there like I, there are two questions about westworld um okay, okay so um, so Ed wrote as a, what was your... What was I was your a supervising technical? producer. Supervising producer on Westworld, which is now on HBO. Um, and it was originally a Michael Crichton property. Yeah. And then it was a movie that was crazy. No, it was, he, it was an original movie. It was he an original movie. Oh, I yeah. thought it was a book. No, okay. he, yeah, I think it was adapted into a Separated rights issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, he did it as a movie through Warner Brothers, so they always had the rights at Warner. Oh, okay, great. Um, so there's two questions. Um... 
Okay, I'll start with this one first. Westworld question. How did you get up to speed on the backstory, Bible, and mythology of the entire series arc in order to write episode four? Oh, well, that's easy. I was in the writing room from December of 2014 until like uh, almost October of 2015. So we were there, you know, sometimes seven days a week, 10 hours a day, like plotting out the whole story um and the showrunners really they they set the they wrote the pilot and they had like a big plan for the show that went for you know years and years and we all sort of helped them fill in all the missing pieces and poke holes in what they were doing to sort of build what is the actual structure of this of this first season and um so by the time I was writing, you know, episode four, I was like, we'd already been there for six months talking right. about all this stuff because that show is so complicated. There's just no possible way anyone could work on that show without having been part of the writing room the whole time. Was there something about um, the writer's room experience that was similar, different, not to the Marvel Summit being, a, being an exclusive writer at Marvel working on the big licensed universe that, I mean, boy, if you want to learn how to or figure out how to how to involve an ent- enormous universe. Yeah. <laughs> Try doing Gambit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, there was... I mean, that definitely was a good experience because I got used to sitting in big boardrooms where people just scream at each other about, about <coughs> dumb story points. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, is the Hulk stronger than Thor? We still will never find out. <laughs> um, also, how does magic work? The... the there were moments in the Marvel in the Marvel summits where, when when it came to Doctor Strange, you could just put your iPod headphones on and just <laughs> pretend that you were sleeping. Um, but yeah, that that really that kind of was a was a good training for it. But nothing really trains you for a writer. Just like like most Hollywood deals, almost every writer's room is somewhat different. That's though true. That's true. their writers' room jobs are interesting because I think everyone who who's on them either feels incredibly lucky or incredibly unlucky. There's very, there are very few in-betweens if you're not running the show them yourself. And uh, most of the showrunners I've ever met were like so stressed out the entire time right, that they couldn't the actually thing. enjoy the job while yeah. they were doing it. Like, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an intense world. But yeah, learning to go from being someone who is mostly sitting at home in my pajamas, you know, writing comic book scripts and then getting dressed if I need to go out. Mm-hmm. Like having to get dressed and go to an office every day. I, I was like 47 when I got that job, and and uh, that was weird. That My was first weird. office job at 47. <laughs> I w- showed up in a suit the first day, and writers don't wear suits to work. So yeah. and we were teasing him mercilessly at that time. My husband and I were like, "Dude, that's what the rest of us do every day. We I know, work." I, I would complain about it all the time. I'm like, "We'd be like, I'm worried if the writing room assistant likes me. I don't understand this. Why I'm." I, I came home like so stressed out if my boss said something weird to me. I was like, ah, having to deal with other people. What a nightmare. <laughs> good God, give me email. <laughs> um, this is a good question, too. Um, as a writer on Westworld and thinking about these issues for hours each week, do you fear the future of robots or artificial intelligence? Oh, God, no. I fear people way more than robots. <laughs> Jesus Christ, there's people who want to vote for Trump. <laughs> Robots would never do that. He's anti-robot. He doesn't believe in global warming. <laughs> no, I. I mean, we talked. We definitely talked about the AI. I mean, I do fear a little bit of the AI future. When, but my fear of it is that we just grow to like just with the internet. If you ever go anywhere, like, and suddenly you have no cell signal and there's no internet at your hotel, like, you just start freaking out instantly. <laughs> Like, that's the thing. If, like, imagine if robot society became so helpful that, like, suddenly it all shut down one day and we didn't know how to do anything anymore. <laughs> it's like error message. Yeah. <laughs> Turn it off and on again. I'm, I'm less worried about them just deciding to kill us, though. <laughs> that would probably be a good idea for a lot of them. Okay. All the ones on Westworld, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a, a, a question, a really quick question. I'll give you a break. Um, it says, question for Caitlin, why would um, Z Comics Lawyer, I like that, in U.S. prefer Seattle to L.A. or New York? Um, that was an accident. Oh, whoops, sorry, I didn't load the question like a dummy. Oh, Speaking of AI. Um, 
Yeah, I, I did not have any preference. Uh, I live here now. <laughs> um, you but, just wanted to take the bar a lot of times, right? Yeah, I just wanted to take the bar in every state I could possibly take it in. Um, just kidding. No, not really. Um, <laughs> You're never moving again. Yeah, I'm, I told my husband we're never moving in. My husband is a TV writer um, uh, as well, so he, we had to move here because that's where you have to live. To And so I had to, you know, after 10 years of being a lawyer, I had to take the bar again, third time. Uh, I'm in New Mexico, took it in New Mexico, took it in Washington, and now in California. Um, so I'm a professional bar taker. Um, but um, honestly, I think that as a comic lawyer, it doesn't matter where you are in the country, in the world. Um, there are comics creators. I have clients all over the world. Um, you know, it, it really the concern is where the publishing company is a lot of times, but that's not even really a concern. Again, our, our field has to catch up with the way business works. Um, so there's that, but Seattle, frankly, the Pacific Northwest, Seattle and Portland, Seattle is where we yeah. met. Um, Seattle and Portland have an, huge comic creator communities. Yeah. They used to be very cheap to live yeah. in those places. They're not any longer. Seattle is very much like LA. I was pleasantly surprised at rent when we moved here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, that's sad. Uh, yeah, it's sad. Because um, tech really does change. And my practice in, in Seattle um, was about 90% comics and then 10% tech. Um, and, but again, I, I represent creators and usually employees. So if you go on to talk about an Amazon employee contract, I'm your girl. Caitlin also a represented a real life superhero. That's true. I did <laughs> represent a real life superhero named Phoenix Jones in Seattle, which was bananas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there was a so, great clip of her on the courtyard steps behind him when he takes off his mask. It's like an like Iron Tony Man Stark. Moment. It was yeah, so it dumb. Was it was like it was it was it was um, life it was a, imitating art. It was crazy. Yeah. But <laughs> so um, that so that's the, hopefully I answered that that question. It was an accident of geography. Um, but as far as TV and film, I mean, you do have to be here. I, I it's taken me a long time to get there, but I will admit now I'm on tape saying this. Yes, yeah. you do have to live here. Um, yeah, I think but, you do. And to be a lawyer. I mean, if you ever want to meet with your clients, it's good to be in LA. I know there are yeah. some lawyers in like Chicago who represent people for Hollywood stuff, that's but true. that's because in Illinois you're allowed to be a I think an producer agent, or yeah, on the, an agent. Oh yeah, a you can be. Isn't that weird? So yeah, so there's some guys who have the, who have a, a Chicago lawyer who is always an executive producer on all their projects, which See, seems weird. like double dipping. But um, also, <laughs> totally like Chicago. Uh, one yeah. of the Chicago. <laughs> one of the things that as a lawyer in this field, I would have to do is I would go on the convention circuit no kidding, to meet with clients. So I would have like, I would go to conventions and, you know, call clients that like, for example, everybody on the Eastern Seaboard, Toronto on down, I would say, I'm going to be at New York Comic Con, let's have some time, let's carve out like 10 or 15 minutes and we can talk about whatever you need. And so it was actually a great way to meet because in this digital age, like you so rarely ever get to meet your clients if they don't live in your town, even if they do. Um, and that was really great to have a face-to-face -face with people and, and get to know them as people, get to know them, they get to know you, and that was kind of nice. I don't miss going to conventions. I don't do it as much anymore because I'm a mom, but um, I, I'm not going to lie. That's uh, kind of awesome. Oh, one more question. Okay. Um, ooh, there's a good question about Breaking Bad. Did you just signal? Are we coming close? One, oh. one. Oh. oh, one more. Okay. Oh, um... Why great TV series like Breaking Bad, um, they, why don't they make it into comics, this studio rights issue? Uh, honestly, they, there's a company called IDW that, um, I mean, the studio has those rights in most cases if it's like a, um, it's a separated rights issue actually, like if you uh, create original content for, um, you know, television. It's Sony. Yeah, Sony is Breaking Bad. So chances are, like, if the if the creators of the, they did not, you know, reserve or or those rights for some other reason, yeah, the studio owns them. The studio can, of course, um, do that. Now, I look at comic books and graphic novels and all that as publishing. Um, little known fact: the WGA can look at them as merchandising, which is a 
issue. Um, but in a sense where you have, or in the, in the situation where you have like a TV series, and then you want to do the comics as you know a sort of ancillary sub uh, right of the TV series, the studio would do that. There's a, a comp there's two companies that do yeah, go quite a bit of it. IDW does almost like I would say. 80% of their yeah. slate is licensed comics like X-Files. They yeah. do great X-Files comics. Star Trek. Star they do Trek. a lot of stuff now. So hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, I mean, you can, it's just a matter of appetite. Probably something like Breaking Bad, too, since, it, it, right. since they're in an ongoing relationship with the, with the creator of the show. Mm -hmm. It's probably based on whether or not he has any interest in that happening too. Yeah. Like, because Vince Gilligan's very important to Sony. They're doing yeah. Better Call Saul, and they have like a big deal with him. So probably, you know, that's why you don't see a ton of Breaking Bad merchandise in the first place. Is he's he's more you know concerned about yeah. about controlling that stuff. And I wouldn't be I would I wouldn't be surprised if there's something in the works as we speak for that. I mean, it's yeah. just it's an opportunity to get to have, to continue to tell stories in that universe. Why I mean, it seems to me we're comic book people, but it seems to me you're leaving money on the table if you don't exploit that right. It just seems strange or that merchandise it just seems very obvious to me. But when you're um, dealing with artists, a lot of them are fine with leaving money on the table, as you know. Yes. I know. <laughs> it, just me. it just kills me. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, as far as the studio is concerned, I mean, like they, I, I find the studios and networks these days are getting far more sophisticated when it comes to exploiting all of those things, and in a good way. I, I use that language in the the like the legal sense. Like it's it's great. We want. Yeah. You know, when you're a creator of a series and you know you see your stuff everywhere, that there's nothing more delightful than that. You know, yeah. I don't think anyone would have a problem with that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks.